Hello, thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, I really appreciate that you're giving us this time to learn together. Um, well, aside from that uh, lengthy intro I provided, <laughs> uh, I can tell you that I'm really passionate about design and all things, you know, um, uh, design the human way, and I'm also passionate about sports. So you might see my feed and my social media with a bit of a mix between today's topic and tons of sports and so you have been warned. Okay, today we're going to review uh, um, an idea, fourth generation recruiting. And um, I'd like to start with a few premises that um, instead of giving you like at the end, what are the takeaways of the situation, I think I'd like to put in front key ideas that we're going to review throughout the session. And, um, and I hope that we can take one, you know, at least one to go with us uh, during the day. So the three premises that I'm thinking here to share with you is uh, what is the latest on talent acquisition? We will review that. And the main thing is you need to feel comfortable with always learning. Uh, talent acquisition, I think, has been a little distracted with a lot of um, operational um, stuff getting us busy. But you need to be always on learning mode. Ambiguity is the norm and change is fast. So if, if one takeaway for today is what am I learning today? Really investing yourself doing that. The second premise is what would you like to, uh, would you like to connect to other people um, instead of just creating pipelines? Um, talent scouting and relationship building are human traits. And when I say that, is we need to make sure that all these tiny little things that distract us or, or, or operations transactions, we need to elevate talent acquisition and become a little more of a strategic human function versus you know this operational one that I just mentioned. And the last part is uh, leave that transactional relationship to technologies at hand. I've been um, uh, last month I was in New York, then to Chicago, came back to Toronto, different forums. And I've heard a lot of times people saying, what if you know, a robot will take over my job? What if, uh, what am I going to be doing here? What is the next uh, wave? And I think we will be okay as long as you're comfortable leaving every transactional uh, thing that you do to a technology at hand. So you can actually reach your human potential instead of you know, doing uh, mundane, routine, uh, routine work. So those are the three main ideas. I know people usually say you have to give them one to go away with, and we'll, we'll get to that one at the end of the session. But we'll review those today. So uh, I'm going to uh, this next slide. Get comfortable with change, always learning ambiguity. That was the first uh, of the points that I wanted to talk to you. And I guess that, that's just pretty clear. We're going to review what is in front of us, and how how fast these things have been moving in in today's world. So let's get to what is what is fourth generation recruitment or talent acquisition. Um, I'll, I'll sum it up in short here. So it means companies have a focus on candidates moved from talent acquisition to talent relationship department. I think that's already a big statement. But what does that mean? So they are now formed with new capabilities, including storytelling, data, design, and digital. Technologies enable them to amplify humanity when finding talent. And I will ask you, just to answer to yourself on a personal level, if you have those skills. Are you really good at not only you know, working with the workload and all these requirements that you have to fill in positions and matching you know, a name to a, to a role, but are you good with your storytelling? Are you good reading data? Are you good with design, with digital capabilities? And if you're not, this is a good list of things that we all need to get on board with. And we, when I say always learning, perhaps these are good areas where you can explore what do you want to learn next? Because as technologies accelerate, they become more capable of doing the routines, right? So uh, I want to leave you this description of what is fourth generation recruitment with the fact that to be in talent relationship, you need to elevate also your, ta your capabilities as a talent acquisition um, expert. 
Um, a little thing about uh, why it's called fourth and not third or fifth is I started moving from from the point when it became online. When we, in the 80s, applicant tracking systems and candidate databases help recruiters access information from a single place, and that was the big woohoo. Um, but then, moving forward, the 90s, online job boards make things easier for both employers and candidates. So that was the big way. But you see, it took almost a decade to move there from one from 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 one side to another. By the 2000s, now there is a lot of headhunters, and LinkedIn comes to place, and it enables you to make smarter searches for candidates. And social media becomes really popular for recruitment. So you are in the third generation there. So you think, what else? If you didn't get on board on social media, you are already late because that was even in the past, right? But today, you are seeing a great amount of things coming. Chatbot screenings, artificial intelligence, you know, for you name it, background check, reference, predictive candidate hiring. So this fourth generation, uh, the industry, the fourth industrial generation also means for us, we need to adopt all these innovative ways of recruiting and attracting talent. But it doesn't mean we have to be doing them all at the same time and people are getting overwhelmed with the amount of opportunity and options that we have out there. So I want to try to give you a little bit of a, a framework on how to think about these technologies so you're not overwhelmed with so many wonderful things or seem to be wonderful things. They have to fit for your circumstances and your organization. And I hope you feel better at the end of the session thinking, um, making sure that now you can say yes or no to the new hoops, you know, the new fashionable technology that comes your way. So that will be the objective. So another question for you, so what are you doing today? Based on what we discussed, are you doing talent acquisition? Are you really busy doing that and matching, you know, matching people? Or are you doing talent relationships? I think it's very hard to move into talent relationship based on the current model of recruiting. Many companies which, who focus on recruitment are actually you know, paid for uh, doing the right match. So obviously, recruiters focus most on people who are the right candidate instead of building the relationships with others. Um, but that, that, that would be the key question. If you work for a company, not in a recruiting company, but in a, in a function within another larger organization, then you have a little more extra teams to help you and support you doing that. But how much of the talent relationship you do will also give you a hint of how ready you are for the future. If you are in the talent acquisition, operational excellence, you're probably uh, shooting your foot because you. Um, this is just a matter of time before technologies can do what you are doing today. So you need to move into what humans do, and that's more into the relationship field. So another thing I want to mention here, I know this is a, a simple slide, but it's a very, it's the core message. Um, talent acquisition teams are too busy looking inwards. So you have fixing operations, maybe catching up, managing workloads, but I'll invite you to forget about, those, about uh, conversa conversions and pipelines. So that will be, expected, that would be simply op um, operational excellence and not a day-to-day -day challenge. If you're still challenged by that, that means you're almost on the third generation, you have to fix that. And obviously, you, you might have the, the, the leadership to do that and the sponsorship to do that, you might not. But if you don't have the power to make that change, you probably need to be in organizations that are moving towards that. You don't want to be um, um, outdated there, you know, with the team. So um, if you are too busy with um, organizations too busy with, you know, reorg, with transformation, with uh, new technologies, what to implement, catching up with what is the latest, and also with what is my recruitment strategy. So the concept I want to introduce here to then uh, arrive at a more of a framework is, we need to think of continuous candidate engagement uh, as a philosophy. So people 
expect things to work. As a candidate, people expect that your system is going to work, it's going to be ready 24-7, it's going to be nice and easy and intuitive, and all that has to be a given. So when you think about continuous candidate engagement, it goes beyond your ATF. That's when practically you're ready you're already finished with the sale. People are convinced and they're trying to get in front of you. They're knocking at your door. But it's not easy to have people to come at your ATS and knocking at your door. So we can't think of candidates just at the entry level ATS. We have to think a little bit earlier and how to engage them during the application process and even the onboarding part. So it's a little of, it's a longer um, uh, more steps into the experience that we need to consider, and we need to consider ourselves in terms of acquisition as part of a team that is going to fulfill that experience, not just the silo that does the conversion transactional point. So continuous candidate engagement is about uh, philosophy, applying a candidate-centric approach to attract top talent. And uh, I have, I, I actually got a few points here that I really like from, um, from one of our partners, Jobbyte, and I really like how they put it. It is a mindset embracing a new way to have ongoing conversations with candidates. But obviously, even if you have a mindset that you are too busy with operations, you can't do that. So you need technology to help you. So, but you need real time, many channels to manage at once. So you can support the areas with tools that facilitate communication, that engage with digital, and it's seamless to hiring and onboarding. So, and obviously making it mobile and easy for candidates, recruiters, and hiring managers to, to do it. So where do you find this kind of technology that now not only has to do the operation right, but it has to enable you to create that relationship with people? So that's the, that's the topic today. So I have a poll for you just to make sure we are awake and drinking our coffee. Um, so here is a poll. I'm going to pass it to our partner at HCI to, to handle it. So the poll today that we're asking our listeners to respond to are, what are your challenges in recruitment? I've posted the poll live now, and you should be able to see it. Um, we're looking for your responses and hope that you'll vote in. You might have others, but you know these are pretty common. People talk about it all the time. So if you have any specific challenge there, let us know. If you have others, that's fine too. Attracting the best, look at that. Hmm. Very good. So we have here in the poll, um, let's give it five seconds. Moving, it's, it's moving a lot. Okay, so we have, I'm going to read them, candidate experience, attracting the company, um, brand, attracting the best. I think that's, that's the biggest thing, eh? avoid making a bad hire, <laughs> building talent pipelines. I think that's pretty clear those three, those four uh, came, came forward. Okay, so I, I think we're okay with that. Thank you. So I'll, I'll show you. Um, we have to go back to the experts who are always uh, helping us there with, uh, with recruiting and, and establishing good relationships with candidates. So I found this, which is really good. I think it matches which response is most, most of it um, by our partners at Jobbyte. Um, the four top challenges in recruitment, if you put them, uh, I just put them here in a, in a little nice, nice way from their side. Difficulty attracting best talent. I think that was our top from our poll, right? Slow to move candidates through the hiring process. Difficulty in building talent pipelines and nurturing passive candidates. Of course, that's probably the big one. Nobody has time there. And then lack of hiring team communication and transparency. So we got we got there a mix. And um, when you identify whether you use the poll or you use the crowdsource response uh, from our session today or from our uh, partners at Jobite, you have their key calls to action, almost the requirements for when you are looking for a technology to help you. So if you take this beyond the poll, you have the top four things you need to solve for. It gives you, um, it makes it easier for you to say yes or no to every single offer that comes your way to hire a specific technology. So I guess that's the first win that we have today. 
Um, and now, how do we make this happen? So I'm going to this. I'm going to work through through these four quadrants um, in the next slides to see what can we do um, immediately and what options do we have for the future. So thank you all for your participation on that one. That was really great. So as recruiters, we often find great people, but the organization sometimes is not ready to take them. Um, or maybe they're not interested in your offer. That might happen too. Maybe the offer is great and you don't, uh, I don't know, you got the perfect job, but a bad experience interacting with the company and gets, you know, gets them out earlier than desired. Um, I just recently had um, a conversation with somebody who was trying to really, um, you know, get engaged into doing doing some work with them, and and, and then after listening to um, how sad the situation was from a personal level, it's almost like um, it's almost deterring for somebody as a candidate, right? Whether it's uh, whatever the relationship is there, but just think of a candidate that hears the recruiter saying. Oh well, we don't really have that here, or we don't really go for that. Um, it is uh, the experience. You never know what touch point is going to give the hint to the candidate to withdraw earlier, and that has nothing to do with the job that you are discussing. So we need to use technologies to to simplify our transactional operation, but also to amplify your human trait because that is what we're here for, to fulfill ourselves and our careers doing that. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. Uh, just another question for you. Are you growing relationships with people or just matching people to jobs? Which was kind of in the first quadrant. So um, I, I took the liberty here to give a, um, a little bit of advice, um, but I'm really passionate about this point. You need to focus on the person, their stories, the right culture to help them thrive, and then bring them at the right time in the organization. And if you see that in a short two-line statement, it is a big job to do that. It's almost like you know taking care of kids, uh, babysitting, but uh, that's what we really have to do. We really need to, um, I have a, a blog post actually on my LinkedIn profile I discovered this recruiter who actually did this. She was so fantastic. I actually put point by point what makes her the great, greatest recruiter I've ever found. And uh, anyways, you're invited to go check out my profile there. But these two lines are a big statement, and this is what is going to make you different from any technology coming to, you know, replace whatever you're doing. So I'm just giving you heads up. Um, when, when there are no rules scripted and you need to create new paths, um, you need to come back to this. You need to come back to these two lines, right? When we need people with character and values and, and, and a lot of love to huma for humanity to do this kind of job and do what is right, even if it's not written on the book. So if we leave our burden of operation to technology, we actually have time to think and breathe and, and challenge, is this the right way to do for, you know, for somebody like me um, or the person that you are bringing in. So I, I would say with everything that we have to do as talent acquisition professionals, we can't do it all and on our own. And that's why a lot of solutions are popping up in the market. And you can hear things like, you know, all the cool things on the blog right now, analytics and, you know, and, and predictive candidate ranking and chatbot screenings, artificial intelligence for check, for background checks, interviews, video, you name it. And, um, you know, I was presenting at the Human Capital uh, Institute conference uh, in Miami just uh, earlier this month, and every single room, everybody, I think, felt like they still need to fix their operation. And I was so, in, I was not impressed with that because we cannot release and unleash the power of humanity if we are stuck with that. And it was amazing that we're still, we have not reached that fourth generation recruiting, even though the fourth generation technologies are here. So it is a common thing. You don't feel like you are on your own if you're thinking that you are in that situation. But 
it is it is common. So we need to explore great examples to help you manage relationship with talent. So when I when I put these bubbles here, I just want to give you a little bit of background on those. So chatbot screenings, um, they help you conduct first level screenings, identify top talent for the role. Um, I guess part of knowing what a four generation recruiting means, it means that you also are aware of the technologies at hand. And that's what I'm just going to describe quickly the list here just in case you're not, but you most likely are aware. But let's just level the ground for everybody. So um, artificial intelligence for interviewing, uh, interview scheduling. How much time do you waste just back and forth saying, can you come at this time or not at that time? <laughs> Are you available here or there? And then you have to do that with the hiring manager, and it's a number of emails back and forth. Total inefficiency. So if you can use AI to schedule your interviews, that's automatic you know, extra time that you're going to have. So you need a smart scheduler tool to identify time slots that work for everybody and all the interviews that you need to manage. So. That's a lot of already out there, so just go really go get it. Uh, another one is artificial intelligence for background and reference checks. This is, uh, imagine you can automate the process to give insight into whether the candidate will be great or not. And I have seen great options in the market to, uh, to, to help you with that, as well as predict, predictive candidate rankings, so they prioritize the candidate based on who's most likely to accept the offer or best fit for the position, or even you know just help you sort out through the numbers when you have a great amount of people to evaluate. And finally, it, this has been fashionable for probably the past four years, and I think it's going to keep stronger, strong going forward, recruiting analytics. The world is made out of data. We can no longer just have a hunch or you have to use your data and predict uh, you know, time to hire, time to fill, cost per hire, even retention, everything, because we need to make decisions based on a factual approach and not just uh, having, um, we can have fun innovating and creating new things, testing new things, probably with the technologies at hand, but we really need to know where numbers to know if it's real value added instead of just a distraction, a distracting technology. So I hope this gives you um, a, a really a, a, a good overview of current technologies. There are many others. I just invite you not to feel overwhelmed and really decide at what stage you are in the organization and your own capability to bring things in, but just don't wait too long that suddenly it's going to land all over your plate, right? Uh, I'm going to move to the next slide. Let me check my time. Yeah, we're good. We're good. We're great. Okay, let's organize all this together. So we have a ton of technology landing on us. We have a lot of candidates that, you know, they, they apply to jobs where maybe they shouldn't, but we are having a lot of flow, mobility, new demands. And you, on top of that, have to have a great relationship with the right people in nurture relationships. So we already established we need to find the right technologies to do the, the routinary approach and operations. So think about this, just four simple steps. You need to get out there and brand yourself. As a recruiter or your company, people need to know, just get to know each other, who you are, what you're doing, what are you here for. And I, I will always like to see recruiters that actually, you can see the person and you can say, oh, she works at that company. You can tell they are ambassadors. And, and the moment you consider yourself an ambassador and part of that brand, it takes you to a different level of thinking versus feeling that you are in the operational side of the company kind of nested in the background. So once people discover that they have the opportunity to be visible, I think you will discover a bigger world to play in, and I hope you like it. But anyways, that's the first part, getting to know the person and let them know about the company. The second part is, not that they know of, of our existence, we need to engage with them with something meaningful, you know, something that relates to them and, and what is the possibility of the future together? So that's the engagement part. You also need a system for that. Uh, this is more on the brand marketing side, but you know, my background is actually a marketer and brand strategist. So this is, this is the part that I actually love. So how to brand and engage people. Um, but not to be scared of that, it can sound ambiguous, but if you have the right systems in place, 
it is really automatic and you can have ongoing conversations with people um, according to what they need. Uh, and then the last part is higher, and you are the experts at this. How do you bring people in? But I think, from my perspective, my insight is you get too stuck into the hiring conversation. What is the conversion? How many people arrive in my site and I converted them? How many clicks? Uh, did they click apply or no? Did they, you know, fell off the application process? And honestly, just think about your friend. Somebody you, you got to know, you you know your brands, you know each other, uh, you engage in conversations, you like each other, you decided that good friendship can start there, and then every time they come to your door, let's say third point, high, uh, the third point, the hiring point, when they come to your door, you can't open the door. Or it is really hard to visit you, you just live in a very remote area. Or it is very hard to even access your path, uh, you know, once you open the door. That's the experience of the ATS. So if we can think about it broader than the ATS and think about you really work out the relationship, you have great systems, great, you know, great fashion to approach people in a personal level or even in an organizational level, why would you be so hard to have a, a hard door to open? Uh, that's what I call that, the ATS. And then let's say they came in into your living room. They you open the door and now there is onboarding. So obviously people expect something to happen. They you know maybe you greet them with a glass of wine. I'm just in, still in the example of your home, but it's the same in the organization. You know where do they sit? What is the washroom? Where do they put their coats and their shoes and their hats? And that's the kind of onboarding, simple onboarding that you will do in your house. But it's the same in the organization. If you think this is a relationship, you don't just dump them into the organization. You you help them set up and, and, and be ready for what's next, right? So I'm inviting you here to think a little beyond just the transactional approach of talent acquisition. You need to expand it into open the relationship at the beginning and also still help them find the right seat, you know, where they're going to be inside the organization in the onboarding part. Now, this might be strategic for teams and my, your team might decide, no, I'm just going to do my talent acquisition part and I'm just going to do, or I'm not going to do onboarding, I'm not going to do branding, that's not my part. But this is an opportunity. Just think of it as a professional. What kind of company do you want to belong to? The hiring process is going to be, uh, you know, managed, by artificial intelligence and you name it in the short time. So you need to amplify your area of impact and the opportunity that gives you to grow, to create into these four quadrants instead of just sticking to the one that is hiring. It's just more as a wake up call um, from professional to professional beyond this talent acquisition conversation. Uh, so that's the framework I want to give you. And when you are in, um, evaluating technologies, you can say, well, uh, is this technology helping me with my branding, with my engagement, with my hiring, my onboarding? If they just come and give you the hiring, which there are many of them, I think we already grow out of that. You know, we are, we are beyond that, and this framework is going to help you be a little more selective with what lands on you. You know, these fantastic bots that come and tell you, your chatbot, or we're going to engage with people, but are they connecting with how are you going to brand them and bring them in? Are they connected to your ATS too? And if they are an isolated solution, it is really not a good option for you. You need something more comprehensive and, and um, integrated, right? Well, I hope that helps you with that slide. Um, uh, we don't have much to go there, but I want to show you a few key ideas. You can go to these sites and check them out. Just straightforward, clean, that have these four integrations in place. Um, they have customized in very different ways according to the culture of the company, but check out Shopify, Glassdoor, LinkedIn. You know, once people go into your site to look for jobs, it means you're already part of the conversation. Be transactional, clean, simple, straightforward. Do not drill them and make them suffer opening that door. Just give it to them, give them the jobs, and give them the application. The work is before and after. And, and uh, so I invite you to check out these sites to see that how they're doing it, very creative, obviously very customized to, to, their, own, to their own thing and what they do. Um, good ideas, 
can be great if you surpass the technology requirements. You might say, I need jobs and location and, you know, whatever um, role, function. So those are the bare minimum requirements, but you have to go beyond that and, and use the framework that I shared with you. So um, I'm going to move to this one. So technology is not a differentiator at this moment. Your character is. I want to shift a little bit from the technology question, the technology, you know, the operation and, and amplify. Now we know that we can amplify from just being hiring people to also kind of brand managers of these relationships. But I want to move a little bit into brand. Just this is going to be a little high level touch, I promise. So we have time for questions. Technology is not a differentiator. Once you find the right technology, which fits for your company, you know it might not be the best that the, the, the company across the street uses. It has to be ready for your capabilities, push you a little forward in your capabilities, but also uh, be within reach so you can get the full potential of that technology working at you, for you and your benefit. But what is really different is your character. So imagine the three companies that I just shared with you use the same technology. But the way they present themselves is based on the character of that company, the character of the brand. And I really like this example from Shopify. We read a lot of cover letters over the years. Now is your turn. We're applying to you. And this company, this brand has always showcased things like they go backwards, right? Like they needed to create this um, this store to sell their things and they came up with their own store so they always put themselves on the other side or what's the solution what we have to solve for so you can have the same technology as the neighbor and everybody else but how you apply it don't lose sight of your character because that's again the human part that is going to come through and don't get distracted with the functionality which should, it should just simply work um, so if you build amazing kind of experience uh, journeys, <clears throat> you can continue the conversation with the candidate. So once you have your character, you can say, how many people I am addressing, I'm addressing here, how many people do I want to hire? You might want to cater or tailor for those employee um, candidate journeys. Uh, that's a little deeper, it's a different conversation. It's more into employee experience, candidate experience and design which we can talk about some other time, but keep in mind, this is where it starts breaking through. You pass the technology requirements, and then you start talking about humans, their journeys, and their experience with you. But you need a technology that has the capability to expand at that level. So my, my second last slide here, to recap, four generation recruitment gets human. That's the, that's the key message. So recruitment finally grows up to integrate people, real estate, technology in that whole ecosystem, and it serves the purpose of a company to deliver the promises made in the employee value proposition. When you look for technologies or for talent acquisition implementations and strategies, you have to check in with your value proposition. What are you trying to deliver? And every single company says, we're going to be simple and intuitive and, you know, and friendly, but you know, you and how many more companies are going to do the same. So go back to that value proposition. What is your character? And choose the system that helps you fulfill that promise, whatever you're promising. Uh, just as a heads up for people who are not acquainted with the with the slang, you know, employee value proposition <laughs> or the jargon, your employee value proposition is the articulation of why people should join you along with employer brand platform. It's a definition of who you are, what kind of people and culture make a great place to work, including what it takes to be part of the team. So when you know that combination of messages, you have a good direction to select your technologies for talent acquisition and select the kind of relationship that you want to build with the candidate. Because it's not just whatever we come to, to our head or the way you you are used to, right? So my last slide here is the most important message uh, after all this is focus on building relationships and let technology achieve operational excellence. We're humans, 
and we're meant to reach our potential with each other, through each other, use technology simply to amplify your human capability, such as love, inclusion, empathy for each other, and keep technologies accountable. Uh, I would love to explain everything about how to keep them accountable, but it is our job to keep them accountable to help us free time so we can grow beyond our day-to-day uh, -day, you know, transaction today. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much uh, what I have for you today. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation on how to create better candidate experiences, I can, um, we, can, we can chat, follow me on social media and we can chat, but i like to know if you have any, any questions, comments, that you want us to get a little deeper into, into one of these slides. Thank you, Estella. I really um, learned a lot today. I wanted to share with you um, some questions that some of our listeners have today and hope that you can elaborate and provide more information. First of all, some of our listeners would like to know what sorts of skills we'd need to develop um, in the near term to deliver a fourth generation type of recruiting. Well, you know what? I want to get back to one of those slides that we had at, in the middle through the middle. Um, sure. and, Do you need me to take that? No, no, I think I, I, I'll just I'll recap here. Um, so we talk about data. Uh, if you want to manage these technologies with a lot of capability, they're going to spit out data for you. So how many people they check in, how many they talk to, uh, were they good, they bad, their ratings, the rankings. So we're now getting not the how-to because the how-to passes to technology. You need to know how to read data and what is the data that is important. And beyond reading data, which is level one, how to read data, that's the first skill, but eventually you will be able to generate insights out of that data. And that is what makes you really valuable. So skill number one is data and analytics and then generating insights. And you know, not many people dare to generate insights. I know PhDs who are really good at creating data, managing data, Describing data, but daring to create insights out of data is a whole different level. And it, it doesn't, you know, the fact that you can have PhD in, in, in math or doesn't mean you are actually capable of doing, doing that. So a lot of experience and training for that. That's the number one skill. The second skill is um, design. Uh, when I say design is design for humans, design what kind of message I'm going to say? How are they going to feel on the other side? Why I'm going to put this long letter or this short letter? Is this going to be, you know, visually appealing or not? Are they going to feel good in my interview? How am I going to receive them? Who greets them, etc. The design is not just, it's not just design on the computer, whatever you're doing, but design the conversation, what you want to get out of the person and how you're going to make them feel. And then that design comes and gets amplified through a third skill, which is digital capability. You no, know, storytelling through storytelling is probably the fourth one I would say, but digital capability is another one because you have to then manage the technology. So manage the technology, uh, bring your designs into a digital format so people can enjoy and, and amplify. And and that's uh, so I would say that that's it. So data design and digital, and if you can get to storytelling, that'd be great. And all, all those skills, they're say, they're, it's say that it's skills for the future, but we should be already, ha you know, halfway going through that as talent acquisition professionals. Um, if you're not enrolling courses to help you that, I mean, this is the time, go for it. Sorry, I went really long there. I'm really passionate about that and all the learning factors. That's sound advice, Estella. Um, we like to say here at HCI that being able to tell a story with the data is one of the most important forms of communication <laughs> um, to help people see what they need to see. Um, one of our listeners, Eric, has a really fascinating question. Um, I'm not faced with this currently, but any thoughts on how to overcome a negative reputation with candidates? Oh. <laughs> You know what I love that, Eric. Um, I think you, that's beyond talent acquisition. That's actually a brand work, and which is I, that's my forte. So 
there are there are many ways and strategies. It really depends on your talent. But managing um, a negative reputation is like beyond talent acquisition effort. Um, it is probably the biggest challenge of any brand manager to overcome a bad reputation. And this has to just show high level. You really need to work it. The voice has to come from inside the organization to refute whatever is happening outside. But then you really need to work out outside to complement the story that the organization is telling. So you need internal, you need external approach, and you need to agree on a story because you have a reputation of whatever is A and B, you know, uh, you need to agree internally that you will have the same story internally and externally and it's now going to be C. And, and this might sound uh, simple, but it's not. And, um, you know, people come out and say, there are hundreds of beautiful things that happen in our organization and nobody knows. Everybody remembers the bad thing. But people, people forget if you throw them 100 great things, right, if you share 100 things, but if you share the one thing that is really fabulous, eventually people start changing that. So consistency of message, relevancy of the message, and a human way of delivery is what it takes to overcome bad positioning. Anyways, we can chat brand management uh, later if you want. It sounds like that helps. part of that brand management might be related to the kinds of communication the hiring team so uh, uh, deliver to the candidate. So one of the other questions that our listeners had was, how do you get your hiring team to provide a great candidate experience? Yeah, and, and you know, um, the touch points are really important, right? And your hiring team is the first one of the first touch points that the candidate has. Uh, you know, these ridiculous things about having 10 interviews and the fourth panel interview, or, or you know, like they give you, keep you hanging for three weeks and nobody tells you anything about it. That's already a bad experience. And who do they think they are to play with people's time like that? So an employee experience is usually briefed and managed by what your employee value proposition says. So let's just say you're going to be the most innovative company in town. Well, your talent acquisition technology should showcase innovation. The way you communicate should showcase it too. And your talent acquisition hiring managers team should showcase that too. How innovative they are, maybe even to greet you, you know, the room where they receive you. And I think because people don't have this uh, integrated approach on what kind of employee experiences or candidate experience are expected, um, organizations are too permissive allowing this to happen. Um, so a way to um, to improve the communication with hiring managers, obviously, you need a good system that does the operational part of handling communication, but then you need an integrated approach that follows uh, through your employer brand uh, positioning. This seems to fall on the heels of another question that our listeners have, which is, um, how can we move away from a transactional conversation and into a more human conversation? Yeah, so yeah, so imagine how much time, um, I'm just gonna take one example that is common to, to, uh, to showcase it. So candidates waste a lot of time booking their interview time, right? And checking in times, the hiring manager, the recruiter is in the middle trying to bring the candidate and the hiring manager times to match. Uh, and that's the kind of transactional conversation. It doesn't add value to anybody. It wastes everyone's time. It's inefficient. That's what I call transactional. Or simply submit your resume. That's also transactional. So first, to move away, you find the right technologies to get you off doing that. And if your job is only doing that, you better get out of that job immediately because it's not gonna help you grow. And if you're not having the technology, you're probably gonna end up being outdated. And then, you know, these silly conversations of upskilling people happen. Um, but if you try to move to a human one, then that means operations are in place, technology is in place, and now you actually have the time to talk about, you know, even, Simple things like what are you going to do this weekend before you start the interview is more human than 
what when is the best time to meet <laughs> right um so you need to separate what can be done with efficiency is transactional to what gives me insight about uh, into this person what they like and if it's a good fit of the company it turns into a more human conversation obviously without getting too personal but you will get trained to be more human if you have time to be more human therefore you need to push to get the capabilities, technological capabilities from your organization to have that opportunity. I really like what you're saying there, but having that human conversation, having that opportunity, if we follow all of those things we do, we follow a relationship model, how can we manage multiple relationships? What's a, an effective way to keep mm -hmm. space in the schedule and handle that effectively? Yeah, so, and remember the slide that we had with the four quadrants, the four things uh, like the framework to choose a technology, right? So if you have multiple relationships, 100 people want to know more about your company. You are not going to respond to 100 people that have the same question, obviously, because there, it is too much and it will be again transactional. But that's when you get into marketing. That's when I'm inviting you to be more than a talent acquisition and moving to the marketing hat. So you can automate, you can find this technology when you're creating the engagement and actually send this information to people. If they already click that they are interested in knowing about your company, there are basic things such as put an extra web page on your site to uh, send them a blog to automatic response or even you know some sophisticated companies are doing chatbots about that. What would you like to know about it? So there are certain basic Q&As that everybody wants to know. Those are the ones that you automatically create with these uh, systems to create engagement. And there are others that might be a little deeper. And today with artificial intelligence, these systems become smarter about what they get asked and they get better and better over time. So that's why it's important to get on the boat as early as possible to get the system smarter for your benefit. But then, you know, uh, something that they cannot respond, that's the time to create a relationship. Then you just, um, you just, you have fewer relationships because the more inquisitive minds are the ones that are going to have more questions beyond what the, the technologies can uh, answer. I think that's really um, engaging information. I know that there's um, a growing use and interest in AI. Um, but what if we're not there yet? What kinds of technologies should we pay attention to? Where should we start? Uh, so, uh, so I'm thinking, um, think about information management, right? Uh, according to the capabilities that you have in your team today, and you might think, okay, okay, who are you there now? We're talking about technologies, but let me tell you. So I grew up as a marketer. You kind of graduate as a brand strategist but you, it's impossible to work without knowing your um, technology and information technology. So I actually study a lot about that too and, and implement it. And what I've seen here is I've seen companies that pick systems and then there is no adoption by the recruiters or by the teams. And they're scrambling and making the system work when people don't have the interest or the capability to use them. So a good way to do it is you can identify, you know, even with the poll exercise, what is my biggest pain today? Let's look for a system that solves for those pains, the, the top three pains of your organization that are, you know, backed by data that are going to create an impact. You already reduce the amount of technologies that you're going to use. Then after that, you can also select how capable is my team to use this technology. And and if you select something that is going to push them beyond their comfort zone but not totally out that they're not going to adopt it, it sounds like a good stepping stone to bring everyone on board with skills to create a new capability and to advance the organization and the function. Um, and then you just keep doing that. It's like a cycle, you know, like this design thinking, uh, just keep trying and testing. But uh, that will help you select those technologies. I think people uh, I think HR sometimes gets overwhelmed by best practice approach or thinking whatever something somebody else is doing is it, probably the right thing to do. And I invite you to just consider these two approaches. What are your requirements and your current capabilities and how far can you push your team to adopt whatever you're going to bring in? 
versus just copying somebody else's approach. Estella, I think that's great advice. Uh, we're down to our last question for the hour. Um, and I think it's really related to what you were just discussing, but Kathleen offers that there are certain legal issues with interviews um, about what we can ask and not ask. So what can we do? Um, what makes the difference to make the process more human, to still meet compliance and meet regulatory standards without um, overtaxing, overburdening mm -hmm. the process? How can technology be part of that solution? Help us with some of those answers. Yeah, you know what? There is a lot of technology regulation. I had uh, one of the brands I managed was in 55 countries. So just imagine times languages, times countries like Canada that have two different languages, times cultural uh, differences, <laughs> and then on top of that you have regulation, compliance, and market sensitivity. That's a lot to handle beyond simple regulation. So uh, one of the skills Obviously, technology can do whatever we want if we ask the right questions, but um, but marketers, I guess, we are skilled to do that. Uh, you know, the, the GDPR just came on board, and you have to get with that. Um, for the ones who don't know, is you know, giving people um, a heads up about what kind of data we're collecting from from their visits to the sites, etc. So um, you go the conversations go to a level of uh, common universal truths for humanity. If you start getting deeper, you're, getting, you're not getting to diversity, differences, and troubles. If you get too far from it, you get into people um, disagreeing with what you're saying. But if you keep it at what is universally human and true, you are in a safe zone. And that takes a little bit of, you know, when I say get a little bit of design skill, uh, you get a little bit of training there on how to be a, 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 a corporate anthropology, you know, expert, and that helps you with that. It is not an easy answer to what you're asking. I think it has a lot of permutations by market, size, company, cultures. So you really need an expert there to help you do that. But you won't launch a, a technology without that knowledge anyways. Um, it should come with advice. Well, Estella, I can't thank you enough for your insights during today's webcast. Uh, we have met the top of the hour. So with that, we'll wrap up with a reminder that today's webcast has been approved for HRCI and SHRM credit. To view your credits, visit your My HCI profile and click on My Learning Journey. For all of us here at HCI, thanks for being here. We'll see you next time.